Hi, and welcome to Survivor Reborn's podcast series. I'm your host, Jenny Millward, and I'm joined once again by Murty Schofield, the writing genius behind Tomb Raider, the Angel of Darkness. Hi, Murty. Hi, Jenny. Glad to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure. Today, we're continuing our special celebration of Angel of Darkness's 15th anniversary with a special QA session. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions to us back on our social media feeds. Let's get started. Uh, first of all, we have a, a kind of a joint question and more of a comment, actually, right. from Veronica and Emily. Yeah. They basically say, thank you for helping to make the best game from their childhood. What is your favourite memory from making this game or what would you consider is the most fun aspect of this project? It, there were a lot of them, uh, but the, the feeling I can remember when I first got the gig and I turned up at core for the first time I just felt like I'd walked into Disneyland <laughs> I'd worked in games before obviously but this this just felt like a huge sandbox to play in and I thought this is really great you know this is a triple-a project um, all these people know what they're doing lots of very talented people lots of resources um, money floating around so that that was fun because of the pitch I'd given it was the opportunity to start really working on ideas I'd had floating around for a long, long time related to um, you know, issues that I've mentioned in the previous interviews, Turkey, Cappadocia, angelic beings or higher beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and actually digging back into all the, the historical and archaeological stuff that fascinated me, you know, the Book of Enoch and Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Uh, Ashes of Angels, all those, just uh, playing around mm -hmm. with those same ideas and recombining them into a story form. So it was great to have that opportunity. Mm. Um, Anna asks, were Lara and Curtis meant to have a child, as it's speculated on some sources, or was this never considered? Uh, for my part, it was never considered because we never got to the point where it would be possible between two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, at the risk of um, repeating myself, I always saw their relationship as um, uh, one of a uh, mutual and benign combat, uh, you know, mm. respect of individuals for each other. Um, and it just, you know, at some way down the line, it may have happened, but it wasn't, it wasn't on my radar. Um, it yeah. just wasn't my, on my radar as a, as a consideration. No. Several people have asked more than one question. So we're going to go through each person first and ask one question from mm -hmm. their selection um, so that we can get as much coverage as possible. Okay. So um, I'm going to skip to Eva, who has asked some really fascinating and insightful questions. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, not, a... not, not that all questions aren't fascinating, <laughs> but um, yeah, there are some that sort of dig a bit deeper into the, the background and stuff, aren't there? So... Well, these definitely do. Right. So, so I'm going to start off with, what was the relationship between Boas and Corell in the earlier version of the script? Why were they working together? Um, well, remembering who Corell was as an absolute master manipulator, the cabal were full of very sinister, very self-motivated people who all had sinister agendas of their own. And they had sworn allegiance to Eckhart because he held out the promise of longevity. And each of the members of the cabal were basically working their own way towards longevity, either to be handed down from Eckhart, which, you know, given his record, probably wasn't likely, or through their own researches. Mm -hmm. And what Kurt, what uh, Boaz, uh, um, the way Corell and Boaz came into an, an alliance, was that they he talked her into withholding a painting. And, and this mm -hmm. was part of his plan to keep all the elements uh, in play until the time that he was ready for, for Eckhart to try and raise the um, the final Nephilim. And he wanted to hold these things at his own pace, according to his own agenda. Boaz, I'm afraid, in terms of Corell, she was just being manipulated by him. Mm. But as far as she would see it, uh, she thought she and he were in cahoots and were playing a very clever game. But basically, um, you know, Corell was the master manipulator and, and he was pulling her strings. Mm -hmm. That that actually sort of answers Eva's second and sort of third question. Why were Boaz and Corell hiding that one painting from Eckhart? You know, would they use it as leverage? Yes. 
Yes, not not openly because you don't do that with Eckhart. With the <laughs> Eckhart, you know, you don't say, "Aha, I've got your painting." You're, you're no, no, they would hide it somewhere mm -hmm. and not discover it in quotes until the right time when Carell uh, decided it was it was an appropriate time. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I don't know whether Carell leaked the information to Eckhart and that's why he bumped Boaz off and gave us such rotten treatment or whether it just slipped or Boaz slipped up and never got into that. But, you know, it did slip that one of the paintings had been um, uh, put somewhere else or, or withheld and uh, Eckhart went ballistic. So, um, yeah, it didn't pay off. <laughs> <laughs> well, to tie off that that sort of thread for a second, um, I'll ask one more from, from Eva for yes. now, um, which was, did Boas actually know of Carell's true nature and knew that Carell would get rid of Eckhart later? Uh, no, no, nobody did, no. Um, Carell played a very, very deep game. Um, you know, he'd be, he'd be enticing people all sorts of promises of things, but basically, in terms of the other members of the Cabal, he would be... Carell, he would just be Carell. He would never reveal his nature to anybody. Uh, and that only came right at the very end of the, the first game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody everybody thought they had all the facts and figures and all the, the details, you know, to play their own game. But no, they didn't. And, and particularly, you know, you've got people like Carell and you've got you've got people like uh, Ruzik, you know, who are master manipulators in their own right. Nobody's going to have all the cards on the table. They're not going to be seeing everything that's being played. Mm -hmm. Well, Let's move on to um, Amy, who asks a couple of questions. One might already have been answered in your previous podcast about uh -huh. uh, what were Boas and Muller's experiments going to be used for. Yeah, that, that happens sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah as, you, as you said, that, that's kind of their, their own personal quest for immortality. Yes. But she also asks, if you could put back in one element of the story that was cut from the game, what would it be? One element? <laughs> mm, if, you, if you could choose just one. I'll just, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just get my list down off the wall. <laughs> um, it, uh, it would... Uh, one. I would have Ruzik playing more of a part. I mean, obviously, mm. I, I've said it time and time again, and everybody knows, you know, Curtis is abilities were curtailed and I'd like to see those reinstalled but yeah I'd like to see Ruzik having more of a part to play um it, it coming up with all the ideas and and you know everybody working like mad and and then I'd, I'd see um I'd see somebody saying oh we can use we can use uh, Ruzik here as this uh this sort of phantom and phantom figure you don't really see very much of what he is what he can do um it is it, it's very disheartening because there was so much that could have happened with him. And I would like to have seen his uh, his private chambers and, and the, the, you know, the, the, the secret levels that he'd got with everything. Um, but, yeah, the what I knew I was doing it. Well, what I thought I was doing at that time was holding him back uh, till game two. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'd really let him rip then and see what a monstrosity he was. Um, so, yeah, Ruzik and, and Curtis I'd like to see. Uh, put back into the game in it with his full powers. Yeah, I think that would definitely be on my list as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to Shemislav. He has another question. He asks, why was the Zenoath scrapped? Was it scrapped entirely or was it meant for game two? Uh, right, well, um, I pronounce it Zenoath. Oh. Um, I, I did a lot of work on this. Um, when we were looking to have the three games, I'd plotted as far as the end of Cappadocia, which would have been at the end of either the second game or the third game. Uh, it was, I'm still, you know, it, it could have gone either way because it didn't come at all. So the Xenoath, uh, basically, it was a, a sort of portal. It was a point of power, part of a defence system, and it was part of the, the Nephilim uh, deep secrets based in one of the underground cities in, in Cappadocia. What we would discussing at the time was a final confrontation between Lara and and um, Eckhart as it was at the time and the idea was that she'd go into some place uh, that was guarded by a Zenoath portal and this 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 portal and this Zenoath place was a place where all the all the energies and all the memories and the recorded histories of the of the Nephilim were kept and stored but it had a tremendous uh, protection around it. And the Xenoath would, would actually power um, the last three levels of the game, which were, it was going to be called the three realms or the three realities. 
and you'd have to get through the Zenoaf portal to get to these. And what would happen was that the um, the intruder would then have to face three uh, deadly situations, all generated from their own fears. And for for example, for Lara, we were going to put in that one of the realities of her own that she went back to was the Lost World area with the Tyrannosaurus Rex from Tomb Raider yeah. One. Yeah. Um, uh, the second one was probably going to be something like the Himalayas, where the plane crashed. And the third one, uh, one of the favourites, was going back to the Egyptian tombs. How did Lara actually manage to escape uh, from the tomb in, in uh, Tomb Raider Four? So those would have been. Th- there were others as well. Um, but that, those were the three. So those were the three realities she'd have to face. And in learning how to uh, combat and overcome her own fears in that, in those three realities, uh, she would then transform and come back and, you know, should have passed the test. But the Xenorath was basically the, the sort of the central energy core, mm-hmm. uh, the power source of knowledge and, and um, basically Nephilim genetic memory. Um, Mm-hmm. It was as, as unspecified as that. And, you know, I never thought what it might look like, what shape it might take. But it would, you know, you'd, you'd cover mm-hmm. that with uh, some great design from somebody like James Kenny. And, you know, you get mm-hmm. some great um, yeah. uh, special effects flickering around and so on. <laughs> I, I was really, yes, I I would have liked to have done the Zenith, but we never got the chance to do it. We, we certainly couldn't have fitted that into, into Prague as well. No. But it, it, it would have been a great conclusion. Uh, to the Cappadocia levels, whether that came in game two or game three, probably game two, um, it would have been a great conclusion. And some of the some of the other possibilities were that through that you could get to um, based within the the Zenoath would be a a transformative sarcophagus which would um, enhance the uh, the blood links of selected individuals. So if they came from any any bloodline that had any promising capabilities, it would enhance those. Or, or we could have gone back to Castle Kriegler, of course, where there's so many levels and ideas that could have been um, used for the story level and gameplay there. That would have been phenomenal to do that. It's an interesting one of my way favorite... to... Yes, sorry, go on. Sorry, it's an interesting way to do a flashback, but also yes. incorporate it into the sort of... Yes, the, the you're, fighting, you're fighting the devils that you've faced before. Um, and, and of course, she'd have the periap shards mm-hmm. with her. And I guess they would have been one of the keys to, you know, as a way of getting out. But you'd have to find out where you would use that. But one of my favourite uh, that we we never even really considered, although I did write it down, was that Lara gets projected into a future space, a possible future space, where the Nephilim race has been revived mm. and humans have been subjugated and are basically little more than slaves. And Lara would then have to find a way of uh, reverting that and, re- you know, re- returning uh, everything to the original timeline and time reality uh, where... The Nephilim were just part of a, a you know, a, a footnote in the pages of history, rather than, you know, the dominant species. Oh, there's a whole game's worth of story <laughs> in that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in that one idea. Yeah, yeah. And and the amazing thing was, I was looking at some notes on these um, some while back, and I realised I'd got all these notes uh, all in place by um, December of 2000, which was the, you know, the first six months in which I'd been working on these. Mm-hmm. And the, the Xenoath was a real uh, generator for me. It was, it, it created a lot of ideas that I thought could have a great deal of use, a lot of exciting use, but uh, yeah, once again, you know, we, we never even got to even look at that. Um, okay. So, uh, moving on, there's a, a question here from, and I love the name, whoever you are really, um, the hunky pharmacist. <laughs> very nice um that's a great surname quite, it, it's a wonderful name yes um i read you were trying to connect the atlanteans from tomb raider one with the nephilim could you elaborate on this um i, I don't remember that i was really it may have just been in a footnote somewhere but i don't have mm. any real recall of that i mean i've always been fascinated by the idea of the atlanteans and uh you know what they could have left behind it wouldn't surprise me if um, if the Nephilim weren't linked to the Atlanteans, I do re- I do remember reading some surmise on that, but uh, no, it, I didn't sort of a, I didn't pursue that. But it would be a great line to follow. Yeah, because in the official Angel of Darkness companion, we have some of the old scans of like the very first uh, concept pieces and ideas that were being floated around for the new Tomb Raider game, and. Back when she was still known as Lara Cruz, it actually does mention the storyline that concerns the Nephilim 
and then that is sort of evolves a little bit into Atlanteans and there's all sorts of connections going on there but uh, that would have been very interesting to explore. <laughs> yes yes it would it would it would um, yeah and it's yeah it's far enough back in history where I'm sure there'd be common routes that you could uncover or create uh, yeah mm-hmm. yeah fascinating. Absolutely. Mm. Okay so moving on Therillium. There's a name we know. Um, hello, Curtis. Uh, how did Eckhart manage to capture Curtis in Prague? Did Carell have something to do with it? You know, when Lara and Curtis separate and she goes after the, the final painting, he's supposed to be going after yeah. Eckhart in his lab to uh, to get yeah. the final shard, but obviously he's captured and thrown to Boas. So how did I'm, that happen? I'm sure it was by um, rapscallion uh, plotting and, and devious means. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, I, I don't know the details of that, but I, I, I've written about where uh, Curtis's father, um, Constantine, was was tricked into a place where he was eventually killed. I mean, it wouldn't be beyond Carell. It uh, wouldn't be beyond. Uh, well, yeah, Carell or um, you know Eckhart to to lay a trap for Curtis. I, I don't know the details. To be honest, I don't know how that would work, but um, it clearly did. What a, what a villain! Mm-hmm. <laughs> and no, I can't, I can't. Yeah, yes, yes, nefarious <laughs> and all. Yeah, let's get out the uh, let's get out the thesaurus here. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back to Anna, who we talked about briefly um, earlier. She has another question, which is: Have you read any of the Angel of Darkness sequels that have been written by the fans? And if so, which ones have you enjoyed? Um. I I haven't. I've just not had the time. All the time since Tomb Raider that I've not been working on uh, on my own project, the Shadow Histories. Um, I've not really had much time to spare, um, and it was only in you know a, a relatively recent number of years that I came across the fact that there was any. Uh, but I, no, I've never I've never actually gone back and, and read any. It's not that I wouldn't be interested, um, mm-hmm. and I, I don't have full respect for people writing their own versions. But um, no, I, I haven't. Um, unless unless we count um, uh, a novelization of Angel of Darkness by by Jenny something I, you may have her name there Jenny <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll, that that does not count at all I'll, because that's of the game itself and definitely not a sequel okay but, uh, <laughs> okay yeah, it definitely doesn't count okay no I certainly read that cover <laughs> to cover but no uh, and and it's not it's no sign of disrespect or anything I just simply haven't had the time i've been doing i've been doing so much work on on the shadow histories and my own my own novels um that, 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 that there really hasn't been the space for me to do that and, and i'm involved in other projects as well so um you know i i, I give my my uh, you know my due respect to everybody who does that but no well let's hope that we see some more of these projects too. oh yes yes um well i'm going to go back through the questions and the eva asked um eva and ferillion both um where, where, where's eva questions. from so, do you know is she i am not sure um eva if you're listening to this uh we'd love to know where you're from and we'd love to know how we can get in yeah, touch yeah yeah because you uh some of the this, some of these questions are really searching uh, yeah, yeah i mean really really interesting um look she's uh she's asking here uh was francine simply pierre's ex or was there more to her story that's basically applying to any of the other side characters you talk to in Paris. Yes. Because didn't you? I think you mentioned uh, in in your last interview that you know world exclusive broadcast <laughs> news that actually it was all Corel the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> in Genesis high heels and everything. I, I've, I've read uh, somewhere that Francine bears a remarkable uh, remarkable resemblance to Janice, mm. um, and somebody was saying, oh, perhaps they use the same. The same uh, model, you know, the, the same uh, why. And um, I would imagine if if Carell hadn't had time to um, shape shift completely, there, w- there would be some similarities going on there. So, well, well, indeed, uh, you know, you've got. Uh, yeah. I mean, all all it would take, you know, is a quick costume change and swap the blonde yeah. wig for a brunette. You know, you, and you're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you 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 may think I am a sister of Janice, but uh, <laughs> I am not. I promise you. <laughs> yeah, yes. she could be, but um, I found it interesting. I say fun, interesting, you know, I wrote it, but um, I wrote her overlooking St. Eckhard's graveyard. Mm. She was she was a kind of uh, custodian. Um, so there may have been more to her story. I mean, she was uh, Pierre's ex, wasn't she? Yes. Uh, the serpent, Le Serpent Rouge. Um, why, why would, why would she have anything that would be of interest to, 
uh, to Lara, why would she be sent there? Again, it's all, you know, who's manipulating who with this? But no, Francine could have some quite interesting backstory. Um, she, yeah, she'd keep a check on uh, a graveyard, but why would somebody be keeping a check on a graveyard? Mm, mm, yeah, yeah yes. there's, there's a the question. The back entrance to Bouchard's Lair, no less. Yes, 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 yes no less. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, yeah there's, there's a story waiting to be told there, certainly. And I think probably she and Janice are... Uh, you know, one of them's the evil twin of the other. I don't know which is which. <laughs> I've always got this oh. thing. Of, I've never used the idea of the evil twin, but I always play around with it jokingly because, <laughs> you know. Oh, we, we've got to get you uh, into Tomb Raider Underworld where Lara meets a doppelganger ah. um, uh, who is quite possibly the most badass character in that entire uh, uh, trilogy uh, of, of characters. Is she green? Who bears also, <laughs> well, actually, she bears a rather striking resemblance to Angela Darkness, Lara, right down to the uh, red braid and the uh, the black leather. Uh, and, yes, it's it's, um, okay. it's rather evocative, okay. shall we say. <laughs> um, going back to uh, Ferulium, where did the name Luddick comes from? Because he claims that it's not actually a Czech name. Or for that matter, where do all of your character names come from? How do you generate them? Ludwig. He's not Czech. Ah, right. OK. Uh, well, what I used to do, I'd go online and I'd download a list of um, different uh, surnames and Chrissy names. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'd check for those. Um, I may have read it from a wrong, a wrong list. I mean, Ludwig goes back a, a long way. Uh, a lot of family history mm -hmm. there. I, I don't know. Um, I may have just that may have been just a straightforward mistake, or perhaps he's um, perhaps he's he's on the run from somewhere. He's come from another country and he's just taken up residence. I don't know. I don't know. Well, it would certainly explain an awful lot of his shifty behaviour. Well, yes, yes, he is. He obviously he's he's had a lot of battering and he's on the run from somebody. Uh, I mean, apart from the fact he's um, is investigating a very very suspicious group of people uh, who he thinks are mafia. Um, so, yeah, but in terms of that name, I, I, I don't know. Um, OK, so another one from Eva. Um, you've spoken at length um, about Morgau and where she was going as a character. Yes. And what, like, she might have been involved in. Yes. Um, but Eva would like to know whether there were supposed to be any other Lux Veritatis babies floating around that nobody knew about or any other uh, offshoots that might be... Uh, lurking in the background there would almost certainly be there's no question about that but it's just um it's just uncovering them and and you know giving them a background history i mean mm -hmm. morgau gets one mention in angel of darkness just her name i think it's on a mm -hmm. i think it's on a a clue on a on a website or something somewhere i think so um that's all she gets mm -hmm. uh, very little mention more than that uh, but what i did was i went on to um you know, extrapolate from there and fill in her back history. And now she's got, oh, she's got virtually a book, a book to herself <laughs> now. Uh, but yeah, there would be other uh, looks very tartis. I mean, these, the breeding communities were producing offshoots all the time. There would be um, breeding batches would be destroyed. Some of them would be set loose. Some of them would escape. So, um, you know, it leads back into this whole thing of Lara and Curtis themselves possibly, possibly being part of a bloodline that's come from the, the breeding programmes or looks very tight. Well, obviously Curtis has, um, but, uh, you know, somewhere back in Lara's own history, perhaps uh, there was somebody, perhaps her father or, uh, you know, her grandfather had had looks very tight connections. Uh, but of course, none of it came to light till uh, the sixth game. So. You see, that's that's the kind of um, extrapolation and surmise I love to get into. Yes. Um, you know, and if Lame somebody was wanting to, everywhere. yeah, yeah. And I, I was wondering, you know, if if uh, if Morga, Morgau uh, was ever in a position where she might want or even be capable of of uh, wanting to produce children, can you imagine? I mean, she's um, she's got she, she's enhanced i mean she's got uh, silicon uh, siliconite collagen she's got carbonite fibers woven into a skeletal structure she's got boosted neural systems and she's been tortured you know extensively imagine what a, a, a child from um coming out of morgau would be like it would be interesting to see what that would be it might be some stage uh, towards what Carell and, and eckhart were trying to breed um something along the lines mm -hmm. of somebody who would be fit to breed with a, a Nephilim and, and, you know, reproduce the Nephilim race. As, as I've said before in other interviews, I'm really fascinated by that, by that idea of bloodline and, and genetics and, the, and this whole mythical mm. background. So, 
yeah but yeah there would be there would be other people yeah um because staying with eva because her next question sort of ties in with that um she says i read a potential scenario for a sequel about a fake lux veritatis group forming or something like that any info on that and how would Corell react to that uh oh favorably he'd love them <laughs> no <laughs> um uh, well, there would certainly have been opportunities for various rogue members of, of the Lux Veritatis. I mean, um, Vasily, Matthias Vasily, became a rogue himself. Mm. Um, his, some of his actions and motives were misunderstood and he became a rogue. Um, I guess he could have considered at some time setting it up, but what he opted for was anonymity and secrecy so as to protect his daughter. Um, but there would be plenty of room for other um, Lux Veritatis initiates or even adepts to to uh, create a, a spin-off group. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Eckhart would uh, he, he may have been even have been behind one. Uh, yeah, I've not not really thought this through. But this is this is this is the great thing of discussing these ideas. You can think, oh yes, you could have a, a rogue looks very tart mm. spin-off group. Yeah, well, they were themselves a, a spin-off of the Knights Templar at one point, weren't yes, they? Yes, so that's it's right. A spin-off as a spin-off. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Infinite it, spin-off. It's what happens with all institutions, religious or otherwise. You know, especially religious ones. But yeah, they all have spin-offs, and they've all got the you know they've all got the one truth, and they've all uh, they all have the uh, you know. Uh, unique and, and um, complete access to the source of everything mm -hmm. so yeah uh, yeah there would almost certainly be the, a chance for that I, would, um, I think fake LV, uh, LV um, would be a, a, a wrong name but just a, you know a spin-off or a, <laughs> yeah they wouldn't see themselves I... we are the fake LV <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't believe it's not looks very yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so going back to uh, Ferillium, their last question will be, how would have Lara reacted about Curtis's mercenary past? Because presumably she would have found out about that at some point. Because um, Lara Croft being a no, pretty notorious um, anathema to mercenaries of all shapes and sizes. Uh, so how, how do you think that she would have reacted finding out that Curtis had been a mercenary? I don't think she'd have had any problem with it at all because she's been pretty much mercenary herself. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> Tomb Robber. <laughs> tomb, yes. Forget Tomb Raider. Yeah. Her own record isn't exactly squeaky. Tomb, tomb, is tomb Robber. Um, uh, and, and you know, the fact that he he delved into some very, very dark areas of, of his own persona and himself. And he'd been he'd been mm -hmm. um, he'd been stuck with this, you know, the title of um, uh, Demon Hunter and so on. I mean, very dark things going on. You do what you need to do to survive. What she would what she would mm -hmm. she wouldn't be judgmental. She would just be assessing in the case of what is this guy after? What is he doing? What what? harm is he able to do me and how how careful do i need to be around him there'd be no bother that it was a mercenary at all in fact you know you'd rather suspect somebody who hadn't had a background that had been you know through the ringer a little bit so indeed it's almost like a mark of uh, honor isn't it there's, well, there's it's, credentials. it's almost like the secret handshake you know <laughs> yeah who who have you been uh, you know doing very um, nefarious deeds for and, and running <laughs> missions for no problem yeah yeah good question i, I like that one yeah so to to round off, because like I say Eva Eva asked an awful lot of, of questions. Good old Eva, yeah, fantastic. Quite, yeah, some, yeah, or well, some of these are, and everybody uh, else as uh, well. I mean, I'm not, so. yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how how people are asking these questions. As I said, a lot of people have asked either uh, the same questions or ones that have been yes. answered in a previous podcast. So we've, we've okay. left those out. But to sort of tie a couple of Eva's other ones together about the Lux Veritatis powers, the psychic powers. Yes. She wants to know whether they can be inherited or if anybody can be taught them. And do all Lux Veritatis have the same set of abilities? Uh, no. First question. Um, yeah. When, with any with any genetics program, you're going to get abilities which lie latent. They might skip a generation. Um, they might yeah, come come forward very, very strongly in, in a particular individual, depending on what they are, their training, what they're put through. Um, so yeah, Curtis would have inherited very, very strong potential uh, for psychic gifts, particularly as his father uh, married a, you know, a Navajo Indian uh, uh, lady uh, mm -hmm. with all sorts of powers there. Yeah, that ties in actually with, um, you know, part of her comment on that one was asking whether um, the far seeing is actually a looks very tartis or an ability that he's inherited from his Navajo mother. 
Yeah. So there's a bit of crossover there, really, isn't there? Who's to say? I mean, you know, they, they, when you've got carriers of gene potential and they've got all this capability, you've got you've got a um, somebody from a, a Navajo uh, side and a and a, um, an LV side. You know, the, the potential is huge. And no, um, not everybody who would be a, a Lux Veritatis a progeny would have the same gifts. It's like it's like a, a library of potential. And some things can be brought out by crisis or by training. So, I mean, Curtis himself, uh, obviously, he was being uh, trained and developed. But I, um, some of his more serious uh, uh, capabilities came through when he was in the Foreign Legion, and he was under tremendous stress from there. I mean, the, you know, the the, uh, the the arcane aspects of his past life kept erupting into his into his present life, and he was having to deal with basically what were demon eruptions. That would bring your capabilities to the fore, but another, yeah, another looks very tartus progeny a child would would perhaps go through the whole life dormant and and never never have those abilities awaken. The same happened with Morgau. You know, she had the potential, uh, but because she was captured by Eckhart and um, and and so badly treated, uh, experimented on uh, her capability. She's barely human anymore, and her capabilities are you know excessive. And she has she has the potential to control a Chirigai, but she can't quite make it because she hasn't completed the training and something's gone wrong with her. Mm-hmm. So she can't control a Chirigai, but she can use one of the one of the Lux Veritatis weapons, the Kulkris. She can use that. That's the, the long spear. Yes, yes, the sort of spear axe weapon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, t- the last couple of questions sort of stay with the Lux Veritatis. She'd like to know, are there any funny stories about the childhood from Curtis? You talk about trauma and desperate training and crises and so on. Um, but did you ever sort of think about any uh, lighter moments from Curtis's childhood that you can remember? Well, I, I always knew that his training would be full of a lot of roughhousing and practical jokes, as well as the, the very rigorous training he'd be put through. I mean, you know, you're talking about um, extreme deprivation and so on as part of the regular training, but there would also be people who were training who were might be a little bit uh, unhinged. Um, and as a way of getting um, getting some sort of revenge, you know, he, would, he wouldn't be beyond uh, carrying out practical jokes. In fact, one of the ones I was thinking he, he may have done at some point, um, just imagine if he managed to get hold of uh, a couple of canisters of that expanding rapid set crash foam that they have in cars, you know, in airplanes. Um, and he, you know, he places those in, in, in one of the latrines in the training quarters set to trigger, set to trigger when the flush operates. Yeah. I, I can just see, you know, one of his, one of his tutors so, in a cubicle it, block, uh, you know, <laughs> locked in a, a sock of a block of solid foam and excrement. And, uh, you know, you know this is sounding fun? way too well planned. I'm, I'm almost thinking that you, you that this has happened sometime <laughs> in life and it's sort of been brought us. I, I've thought about the, yeah, what, yeah, what, what sort of extreme things, you know, what sort of practical jokes with a particular semi-lethal edge would would uh, curtis be playing on on them and mm. would other people be playing on him you know they'd it'd be all sorts of things you know is this actually a true uh looks very tartist training technique or is is it this this you know slightly unhinged adept who's just mm-hmm. being brutal uh just j- just torture him a little bit and uh curtis wouldn't take that lying down no <laughs> No, give as good yeah. as he gets. Out of and him. who knows what yeah. the final stage was with Curtis when he finally decided, oh, that's it, I'm enough. off. You know, enough. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and do something. And of course, he joins the Foreign Legion. It, it may have been that one of his own practical jokes went wrong. <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of potential there. <laughs> yeah, he ended, he ended up doing some real damage to an adept. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, did a did a run us rather than face the music. So, okay, so the very last question. Uh, again, comes from Eva. If Lara accepted Carell's offer, would Carell really have brought him to his side? You know, was he being genuine when he made his offer of alliance? The question to ask yourself about that is, who is this guy? Who is this being? Because he's not a guy. Who is this being? He's he's one of the last uh, standard bearers of his race. He's got everything to lose in this. He's going to do anything and everything he can possibly do to bring about the re-emergence of his own race. He'll promise anything to anybody. And if it suits his purpose to actually keep that promise, he'll keep the promise. But if it doesn't, he won't mm-hmm. hesitate. 
So whatever he promises to Lara is probably genuine and means it at the time. But there's always that, you know, read mm -hmm. the small print. This guy is thousands of years old. He can't mm -hmm. be trusted. So if it, if it had suited him to take Lara along and incorporate her into, into, you know, whatever his plans were, it may have happened. The question is not what whether he's serious, it's whether Lara would be able to do, mm. to go along with that, whether she'd accept it. And I don't think it's in her genetics mm. to accept uh, a sort of compromise offer or something that she could see as um, uh, leverage or, or corrupt, uh, a corrupt offering. She just wouldn't well, she take says, it. Well, she says, you know, you are kidding, right? You know, as she, she well, is exactly, being yes, very yes. sincere about, you don't really mean that. Yeah. You know, after all we've been through, after all I've yeah. seen you do, you're asking me to trust you yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, she's nobody's fool. She's nobody's fool. Uh, but people have, plenty of people have been um, uh, Carell's fool and have gone along. Boaz, yes. for example, you know, what, what, what on earth did he promise oh. her? Um, he wouldn't have revealed himself as the shapeshifter, but he would have been promising all sorts of things to her. So, uh, yeah, the, it's a being that's not to be trusted, really. So, Murti, to end this podcast and to as a thank you very much for coming along and sharing all of your wonderful enthusiasm and knowledge about the Angel of Darkness, I'd like to ask one final question, and that is, what are you doing now and where do you want to go next? Ah, right. Um, well, since well before Angel of Darkness, I was working on my own series of novels called The Shadow Histories. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, that's why I dropped the shadow histories in as a clue in one of the um, yes. one of the, the faxes, yes. just as a little a little tingle there. Um, yep. So I've been working on a lot of this material, a heck of a lot of this material, and you know it's one of the things that people have mentioned before. Uh, you know, the, 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 there seem to be some similarities between shadow histories and Angel of Darkness, but the fact is, I'd been working on the underlying concepts of the shadow histories years before I got invited to, to core at the, in Derby. Mm -hmm. um, and there's bound to be a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the interest in higher beings who may be angels, may not, maybe from another planet, another dimension, who knows. Um, but so the shadow histories is a series of six novels. I've completed two uh, and they're available on Kindle. Um, and I've I've written the the plots and the or uh, you plotted out every everything for the for the following four and I've been working on those over the last few years. It's t it's, t it's slowed down a little bit, but um, yeah, there's still the interest there. And there may be something in the background. Um, I've been approached by somebody who may have a, a multimedia interest in the Shadow Histories as a project to do something with, and I'm not at liberty to say very much more than that at this stage but uh, if people want to go and check what i've been doing with shadow histories there's a shadow histories facebook page yeah um there's my own website page uh, murty schofield i've got lots of stuff of shadow histories on there lots of artwork um so yeah please check it out that's that's oh absolutely all the the links are in the description yeah. and we we do really urge you to to go along and check them out if you haven't already encountered shadow histories and you are a fan of Angel of Darkness especially, you will pick up a lot of the themes and just the language, the, the style of it is, is so reminiscent and so closely tied together. It, it, you can definitely tell it's, it's a labour of love that you've made it. Yeah. yeah, they work with the same elements. You know, they work with a lot of the same elements and mysteries, so there are similarities, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for all of your time, oh, thank you. Mercy. Th it's been a delight. Thank you for the opportunity to, to rub brains together. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what sparks will fly yeah. when you do it. Neuron brain sparks, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this podcast, remember to hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon so you'll always be notified of a new episode. Plus, check out Survivor Reborn's social media feeds. All the links are in the description. Happy raiding. <laughs>